So I got a way down deep salvation like no mortal tongue can tell And a standing invitation to a hallelujah spell Oh, won't that be that a high meeting when we step on the other side When the saints are the and sing and reach and welcome us across the tide We'll do that to our hands, go shout on through the land And when you think it's just about it, it'll happen all over again Oh, won't that be a high meeting when we step on the other side Across the time, we'll live as we can. Go shout all through the land. And when you think it's just good morning, KCOG. How are you doing this morning? Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's all get a seat. We're filling up. Isn't God good today? It's a beautiful day. Got a little sun yesterday on the motorcycles. Feeling good. We're trying to talk faster and to get one. We're getting close. We're getting real close. We're going to start us a KCOG Wild Hogs group. <laughs> today is the fifth Sunday, so we're going to start something a little new today. We're going to go back in time with the songs, but they've got a little newer twist to them. So let's all stand. Get your, get your lungs expanded this morning. Get these little tin stringed instruments, your tin fingers, and put them together. We're going to sing that song, Victory in Jesus. Amen. I know how much you love country music, Pastor. This is just for you. And I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from the world How he gave his life on Calvary To save I heard about his growth. 
this morning. We have the victory because of what Christ did on the cross. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And for that, we're so thankful, God. We exalt you in this place today, God. Hallelujah. You're high and lifted up this morning. We exalt you. Worship you, God. We exalt Thee, the name above every name, and we exalt Thee. We exalt Thee. Oh. Hallelujah! Give Him a hand, clap of praise this morning in this place we exalt you today father you are high and lifted up there is no one above you god hallelujah we thank you jesus we thank you for who you are 
You're so worthy of all our praise today, Jesus. And we love you, Father God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. You're worthy of all our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name in this place, Father. You're great. When something's great in your life, don't you get a little excited? Is he great this morning? Can we just worship him like he is actually great in this place? Thank you, Jesus. this morning 
Hallelujah, you're great Hallelujah. and greatly to be praised in this Hallelujah. place, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah. We serve a great, great, great God. No matter what we're going through in our life, no matter how our week may have gone, no matter what we may be experiencing or struggling with, all we have to do is fix our eyes upon how great our God is, that He is sovereign, He is transcendent, He is above all things, He is in control of all things, and there's nothing going on in our life that has surprised Him because He is so great. And let us just worship Him with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, all that is in us, praise His holy name because He is a great, great, great God, a holy God, a perfect God one who cares about us and one who not only did he put the stars in the sky and the planets in orbit he knows every aspect of our life he knows every tear we've ever cried every pain we've ever felt and he is always there with us to never leave us and forsake us he is a great god hallelujah hallelujah you may be seated I want to welcome you to Kincaid Church of God, and I want to proudly announce that we are finally online the way we're supposed to be. Uh, we got the camera set up yesterday, and I encourage you again to, to look at our Facebook page, because some of you never do, and to uh, like it, comment it, and share it. Again, this is not just to glorify ourselves. The more we do that, the more it exposes people outside of the body of Christ to the Word of God and that is our only motivation in this online system it is not church promotion it is God promotion and we're wanting to promote him around the world that people can watch our services and hear the Word of God no matter where they are as long as they can they can get online and we want to you know we want to continue doing that we're going to continue our worship and offering uh, I also want to share a little bit about the building fund next week we're going to ask everyone who will to spend this week in prayer about the committal of what we can give in order to fix the roof. Now this week, I mean, I've been really struggling with the cost because as you see, it's going to be $60,000 to fix the roof. We got a bid and get the interior and the, you know, the exterior in shape where hopefully we never have to worry about rain or ice again. Uh, but I've been really struggling with this this week because one, I don't like to ask for extra money and I don't like to spend money that is not necessary. And I was praying over this all week, and I just felt like God just saying, you know, you, 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 when something is broken, patching it doesn't do it. You have to fix the problem. And I kind of thought about that in our own lives. So many times we just want to patch over the things in our life when God wants to fix them and make them new. And I just want you to spend this week in prayer uh, about what you can commit to give in one time and then we're going to ask, ask, ask you to make faith promises and we'll talk about that next week but next week we'll take the offering for the building hopefully the construction is going to start very soon and hopefully we will never have a leak in our roof again lord willing uh again this is not something that we're doing because uh we want to this building belongs to god yes it belongs to a denomination and it belongs to a church but ultimately it belongs to god and we need to be good stewards of what belongs to God. We need to keep it clean, and we need to make it as presentable as possible and to care for it as possible, and this is part of that. Also, this is Mission Sunday, and we have a new missionary that I would like to support, Madhu and Shiju, Shijo Varghese, and their son, Micah. Uh, also, Madhu has one on the way. I train these people. Uh, uh, Shijo is from India, Madhu is from Nepal, they currently live in the United Arab Emirates. They are very, very close personal friends of mine. I credentialed him with his exhorter, his ordained minister, and his ordained bishop. Uh, I led her through the SIMS program, which is a Church of God educational program, and they're wanting to go to Kazakhstan as missionaries. Now. Outside the U.S., our churches are not very supportive of missions. And so I told Shijo, I will do all I can to help him raise his budget, and I want our church to be a major part of that. Because I want, I know these people personally, and I know how hard they're going to work, and I know what they're willing to give their lives for the sake of the gospel. And even though they're a young family, they're willing to even put their children in risk in order to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world. So at the end of the service, 
The ushers will be standing at the back with buckets, and we're going to commit our first offering to them. It won't be the last, I promise you, because I want us to support them on a monthly basis and help them build their account. And hopefully one day they'll be able to stand in this pulpit and share the gospel. With, with visas and stuff, it can kind of be difficult, but I want to bring them in and, and hopefully be able to share their heart with us. Uh, all right, ushers, you can come. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that we have the opportunity to give back all that you have blessed us with. You are a great God, and you have provided everything we have. Nothing that we possess was not given to us by your hand. The jobs that we have that provides the finances, you gave us those jobs. You gave us the strength to do those jobs. And as we give back to you what belongs to you, and in addition to missions and to the building fund and to benevolence ministries and all these things, We pray that you will use them for your glory, use them for your purpose, and I pray that you will bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. children have been taught by Miss Kay and myself and Miss Janie and we've had so many teenagers and other adults that have worked with them faithfully. We have had such wonderful lessons. I know the kids were really excited when they learned about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And then after that we learned about the holy sacrament of taking communion and what it really means to us. We had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We had his death, his resurrection. We had him, his ascension on the mountain. And then after that, they taught them about feeding the people and feeding the disciples. And these children have worked and they know it, but guess what? They're scared to death. Okay, so... We're just going to act like they're singing to mom or singing to me, and they're going to do fine. They have a song that they're going to sing, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus.
want to thank all of our children workers for their commitment to work with our kids. You know, so, sometimes we think that's just so they won't disturb the service. It's not. Uh, when I got saved at 21 years old, I remember almost every Sunday school lesson I ever had as a child. We didn't have children's church when I was a kid, but we had Sunday school. And I remember so many of those lessons. And I know that seed was planted in my heart at such a young age. And that, that's what brought the harvest uh, as, I, as I was older. Today is Graduate Sunday in which we want to celebrate our graduates. Now, I do apologize. Carrie and I forgot for completely that this was Memorial Day weekend. We forgot that when we planned the men's meeting and the women's meeting. We've been out of America for a long time. We didn't have Memorial's Day where we live. It'll take two or three years before we start remembering all these holidays exist. But we're going to celebrate our graduates today. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have, I think, seven, seven graduates, and we're gonna, we have a gift for each one. And I'm asking the department heads for each ministry to present these gifts and to call out the names. So I'd like to call Dave and Jane, who are over our youth ministry. And after them, Sister Lisa will come to present to the children. Good morning, everyone. We're glad that we can be here today. I'm Jane, and this is Dave, and we're older people in a new position <laughs> as youth leaders, so we're glad to be able to uh, present these gifts. Um, and I just wanted to say, if there was one small piece of advice uh, that I could give to these students, it would be to ask God to show you his will, and he will lead you in his ways. Um, and I would also share one verse that has helped me through many times of anxiety and fear and just going through the unknown, and that's Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So um, I'll call each student or graduate up individually. Don, Donnie Denning. He's the son of Lisa and Donald Denning. He's a 2022 graduate of South Fork High School. Donnie's favorite subject has been math. He is a class officer, treasurer, and volunteer firefighter. He plans to become a welder and work at Caterpillar. His advice for the younger students is, if, you've had the if you have the opportunity to take college courses while in high school, do it. It allows for a good head start in any career path. And he shared a favorite memory at KCOG, and that is working with his mom in Children's Church. He says it was entertaining and a good time. So congratulations, Donnie. We're gonna have you stay up here, if you would, please. Uh, the next student we would like to bring up is Miley Austin. Sorry. Um, her parents are Brent and Lindy Austin, and she is graduating from eighth grade. Her favorite subject is math. She participated in volleyball at Athens Junior High. She will attend Athens High School in the fall. Her plan for the future is to go into the medical field. She advises younger students to enjoy life. Her favorite memory at Kincaid Church of, at Kincaid Church of God so far has been hanging out with Lily and Rayleigh. So congratulations to you, Miley. to read off as well, and one's not here, but we're going to go ahead and celebrate Cameron Engelman, Engelman <clears throat> excuse me, daughter of Elizabeth and Brandon Engelman, and granddaughter of Ron and Cheryl McCavitts. Her favorite subject in junior high is math. Her extracurricular activities have been basketball, 
volleyball, softball, and student council. And it says she will be moving on to Nokomis High School in the fall. And it says she has not yet decided on a career path. And her advice to younger students is getting involved in your school with as many things as you can. It says her favorite memory at KCOG is sitting next to her grandma every Sunday. I'm not a crier. This would be easy. Um, <laughs> next one is Ray the Aller. <clears throat> She's a graduate of South Fork Junior High School, daughter of David and Terry Aller. Her favorite subject is science. She's played volleyball in sixth and eighth grade. After graduation, she will spend her summer preparing for high school and hanging out with family and friends. So she does not have a career path planned at this time either. It says her, her advice for younger students is it's better to have a small group of close friends than a big group of not so close friends. So her favorite memory at KCOG is decorating Christmas cookies with women of the church. <clears throat> and I wanted to share something. Um, but I remember whenever we first started coming here and they had a Christmas play and Cameron and Rayleigh, I wish I could have found the picture, but they had these Christmas present boxes on them and they were about this tall and they came up here and of course those two came up and they were like just standing here, they're supposed to sing something. And I just remember Rayleigh going, <laughs> and that's how she, <laughs> how she was so big with that. But anyway, congratulations to y'all. So, Miss Lisa. Wow, this is a, an awesome opportunity. Uh, I uh, watch over the kindergarten, preschool uh, children uh, through K through fifth grade, and then they move on. And it is, it's almost selfish sometimes to me because uh, it's such a blessing uh, to watch these little kids grow and change and learn. And then teaching them, I find myself learning as well. And uh, it's such a blessing, and God is God is awesome. And uh, at this time, we want to recognize our kindergartners that will be graduating. So first off, we have Rose Benavides. He is not able to make it today. Um, and then we have Zoe Jackson. And we have Shay Rodden. And we have Rin Rodden. is Jonathan White. All right, at this time, I think we want to take a moment to uh, pray for our youth. Uh, these youngsters here, kindergartners, one day will blink and they'll be seniors and eighth graders and uh, growing in Christ. And it is great to have a family and look at all of you and know that you guys encourage these youngsters and they watch you and they're growing and we pray for them and it's so exciting to know and watch them as they go in their next step and their next journey. And guys, always remember, God is with you. Just call upon his name. He is with you. Our children and our teens, they face things in their life that most of us didn't grow up in school facing at a kind of a unique time for our nation. But God is able to protect them all. Uh, no matter what kind of darkness they have to walk through, God can allow them to be light and to be salt. And let's pray that they will be just that. They'll be light and salt wherever God sends them, and that they'll be protected in mind, body, soul, and spirit.
and that God's hand will be on them and he will use them for his glory. Please point your hands in this direction. Let's pray for our, our children. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for our children and our teens. I thank you so much for those who commit to spend their time to teach them. Lord, they do face challenges, and you know each one of them. And I just pray that you will protect them. You will protect their mind. You will protect their heart. You will protect their body physically. You will keep them safe and healthy. And you also help them, these seeds that have been planted by these people who, who pour their life into them Sunday and Wednesday nights, that you will allow that seed to continue to be watered, and it will grow into a harvest, and that you will let them be the salt of the earth and the light of the world wherever you take them. I pray that you will order their steps because you alone control our future. You hold our future in your hands. And I pray that you will bless them, you will provide for them, you will protect them, and help us as a church to always let them know that they are not insignificant. They are not small. They are beautiful in your sight, and they are precious to us. And may we support them and encourage them in every step they take, even when they fall down, even when they make mistakes, that we'll be there to help pick them back up and to be there for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Amen. This is just one of the many examples of how... Uh, you know, the pastor often gets a lot of credit for things that we don't do. <laughs> well, we also get a lot of the blame for we don't do. But we get a lot of credit for things we don't do. And I think this is always a symbolic thing of how it takes us all to make a church. That we need people to teach, to, to teach the youth and to teach the children. And I, I'm just so grateful that we've had so many volunteers to do that, to take care of the nursery. People who, who, can who know how to take care of the building. I mean, Brent and Jeremy are invaluable to us. Uh, just so many people making our church what it is, and not one person, and of course, in totality, God gets all the glory, but each person, and it's okay to, to pat people on the back and say, you know, you're doing a good job, and I think God is pleased with you, and I think that God would like those of you who do serve in some capacity to know he is pleased with you. When you do anything with your whole heart, it doesn't mean you have to do it perfectly, it doesn't mean that you never make mistakes, but that he is pleased with you, and he is blessed in your efforts and what you do for his kingdom. And if you don't have a place to serve at Ken K Church of God, I really encourage you to get involved somewhere because there's always a place in order to lift people up and to encourage and to play your part. All right, we just have one announcement. Oh, two announcements, I'm sorry. Uh, next Sunday, the town village of Kincaid is having the Sunday fun day at Kincaid Park. Yes? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, th now I, I, I've mentioned this before. This is something the community is having. We, are, we have sponsored it as a church. We've helped them a little bit. But I want us to be a part of it. I think too often, community workers and leaders and church leaders are separate. And I don't think that that pleases God. I think that we need to be a part of our community. We need to help them where we can, even though as a church, we're not controlling what's happening over there. Uh, if you go over there, you might see things you don't want to see as a church member. But that is how we become salt and light in our community. And so next week, I want to encourage you, after church, it starts at 1 o'clock, to go over there. There's going to be games, there's going to be boat rides, and all kinds of really cool stuff uh, to spend time with our community. They're going to have food. And my understanding is everything is one dollar. Can't beat that. If you think you can beat that, go to a St. Louis Cardinals game. Uh, but they're going to have pony rides, a dunk tank, paddle boats, face painting. Also, they're going to have a family feud game. And Kincaid Church of God is sending a family to be a part of that. Uh, I guess I'm going to be the papa of the family. Uh, but also, we're going to have Jamie Aller. Dave and Jane, and Lynette Jackson. I was shocked. So if, if we lose, I'm blaming Lynette. So, <laughs> but it's going to be just a great time of fun and fellowship, and I really want to encourage you to try to come over there and be a part. Why? Just to let your light shine. 
just to love on the community, love on the people. <clears throat> you can talk about how, you know, if you get an opportunity, talk about how much God has done in your life. Tell them about how much the church means to you and how much the church loves the community. And I hope that we will all go over there and reflect that. Also, because since we're going to be pretty much going from church over there, we have declared next Sunday Aloha Day. So we're going to encourage, I don't have a, a, a graphic for that. We're going to encourage everyone to wear a Hawaiian shirt next week. Now, let me tell you something. I don't own one, but I'm going to find one somewhere. Now, I, I will say this. I personally cannot wear shorts to church. I just got too much of my granddad in me. I just can't do that. Uh, but, you know, I, we want you to dress Hawaiian, okay? Whatever that means. And, uh, you know, the wilder the shirt, the better. And so I want to encourage you to do that. So next Sunday is Aloha Sunday. Uh, so come with your Hawaiian shirts. I saw one at the, at the baseball game, but it was like $129. So I, I'm a Braves fan anyway, so it don't matter. But anyway, and today we do not have children's church on the fifth Sunday of the month. We want the children, I mean, every time we have a fifth Sunday, we want the kids to be a part of the service. The reason that we do that is we want them to know they are a part of this church, that we don't shove them downstairs to get rid of them. They are, a, they are a part of this church. They're not the future of the church. They're part of the church now. And so every fifth Sunday we'll be in there. And again, I want to just thank Brent and Jeremy for the work that they've done getting the camera set up and all that. We've spent a lot of hours working on this, and we're just really happy about uh, uh, the, the guy, who Jared Owens, who came from... Lincoln to help us out, and we're, the church is going to, you know, send him a, a, a love offering because of all the hard work that he did. But we're just glad to be online, and that is the reason for the lights to be out. The camera that we have is very good, and if these lights are on, it picks up that light too much, and it, you know, it doesn't work out so well. So I just want to uh, let you know that. Okay, we're going to continue our series on expressing our love to God. I also want to welcome. We have a guest. Who has traveled a little bit farther than average to be here uh, we have Penny's nephew Andreas from Sweden and I just want to welcome him to Kincaid Church of God I've been a lot of places in the world I've been to like 62 countries but I never got to go to Sweden I, I was supposed to go last year and I came to Kincaid instead uh, so uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely I would love to also we have uh, uh, Kathy and Brian Yawn, all the way from Cleveland, Tennessee. They're here today, and we want to welcome them. Uh, again, continue to pray for Sharon Summers. Also, continue to pray for Judy Mann. She's having a heart issue. She's in St. John's, and I think tomorrow she's going to get her heart catheter, hopefully to, to, to clear the blockages in her heart. But we have a lot of people who are sick, a lot of people who are traveling. Just keep them in prayer uh, as, we, as we go about the service. In our first sermon, we talked about being the church and the importance of connecting with God when we come to church. And then in the second sermon, we talked about what that Satan's great desire is to keep us or prevent us or, or dis, you know, distract us from worshiping God. Last week, we talked about God's greatest desire is for us to be his companion. And the desire that we have for a companion in our life was given to us when God made us like him when he created us. Today, we're going to talk about giving thanks to God, which is something I don't think that we do enough. I mean, a lot of times we're asking God for stuff. We're praying for stuff. We're praying for people to be healed, or we're praying for people to be provided for, or we're praying for encouragement or assurance or salvation. But when, those, when God does those things for us, we don't spend enough time thanking God for what he does. And giving thanks is a large part of what it means to express our love to God. And throughout this series, we were, we're wanting to express that love to God because love, by its main characteristic, it must be shared. It must be expressed. And we've talked about that when God, before creation ever extended, the Holy Trinity that was experiencing a perfect love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the reason that they created was that they desired to share that perfect love that they experienced with one another. And love... Holy, godly love must be expressed, and if we love God, we have to express it in one way or another. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 19. It will be on the screens. 
On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priest. As they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go your, on your way. Your faith has made you well. Now when you look at this text, when it says made you well, if you look at the Greek word that's used there, it is the exact same Greek word that is often translated saved. So he could be saying your faith has saved you. And the, you know, kind of the remarkable thing about this story is the one that returned was a Samaritan, which this implies that the other nine that were healed who did not come back to thank God were Jews. And if you know your Bible history very well, you know that there was a lot of animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. Basically, they hated one another. And Jesus pointing this out that it was the Samaritan, it was the foreigner, it was the one who was not part of the people of God who came back and thanked Jesus for what he had done. And we need to be people who want to express our love to God because when we express our love to God, that is worship. As Brent sung those songs and as we, you look at the words, it is so easy that we just look at those screens and we just go through the motions with no expression of the heart, no expression of what God has done, no expression of who God is. Even when we're singing, How Great Thou Art, how often do we not even think about the greatness of God? Even though the words are pointing out how, much, how great he really is, we can go through the music just singing the song, never even giving it much thought. But if we truly realize how great God is, if we truly realize how good he is to us, our heart will bubble forth with thanksgiving, which will find its way being expressed in the love of worship. And we need to do that. But what caused this Samaritan to come back and express his love and his thanks to God, what caused him to come back and worship God when the other nine did not? And so we're going to talk about three things about giving thanks. Number one, gratitude produces worship. This guy had a lot of gratitude. Luke 17, 15 through 16 again. Then one of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him and he was a Samaritan. He outwardly expressed it. Notice he didn't just say, thanks Jesus. No. He outwardly expressed it. And one of the things that's really important is about the inward things. We have to have that. It has to come from the heart. It has to come from deep within the soul, that appreciation and thanksgiving to God. But it's going to be expressed externally. It has to be expressed externally. The heart was thankful. The body responded. In our Wednesday night class, when we were talking about spiritual transformation, that was one thing that we really keyed on, is when we have our heart set right, our will, our spirit set right, and the mind is, is, is following the will of the heart, the biblical desire of God, the feelings will follow, the body will begin to express that love and that gratitude to God. That Our whole entire being must be transformed, and as we allow that, we will express God, and we do that through worship. So what produces genuine heartfelt worship? Gratitude. Gratitude produces worship. Gratitude alone. He gets healed and he is thankful and he is thankful for Jesus for what he did for him. And that produces worship. I mean, how many of us, I mean, I've, I've been in this church now for a year and how many people I've heard, oh, God healed me, God touched me, God provided me, God saved me from alcohol, God saved me from drugs, God got me out of prison and he, he's, he's changed my life, he's given me everything new. Then if that is our story, if each one of us can come in here with a different story saying, I was in the pit of hell, I had one, fit in, one foot in to torment, one foot in the grave, but Jesus entered my life, he changed me, he transformed transform me, he saved me, then every time we walk into a building, we should be able to worship and glorify God. Well, you think, you think, well, I haven't had a good week. 
Who cares when I know that my eternity is secure in Him? Who cares when I know I have been taken from darkness into light, from death into life, and giving that life in Christ? When I realize who God is and I'm overwhelmed with all He's done for me, all that He's provided for me, regardless of how I feel, regardless of the weekend or the week that I've had, I can worship Him because of who He is and what He's done. I think sometimes one of the things that I see happening in our country is we're losing the sense of gratitude. Children do not think their parents. Parents do not think their, their, their parents. Friends do not think other friends. We've gotten where we just, we're so enabled, we're so entitled, we just expect to get everything that we've lost the heart of thanksgiving. And I think nowhere is that more clear than in the church where sometimes our attitude is almost, God, what have you done for me lately? Instead of what you have you done for me in eternity. When we are truly thankful for what God has done for us, the natural response is to worship him. This man was healed of leprosy. Was it appropriate for him to thank Jesus the way he did? Was that appropriate? He fell down on his face. Everyone was watching. He was shouting. Man, that's embarrassing. Was that appropriate? Of course he was appropriate. He was just healed of one of the worst diseases that ever struck mankind. He had leprosy. He had to stay away from people. It was naturally appropriate for someone who was healed of something like that to do something tremendous in order to thank the person who did it. But was it biblically appropriate for him to act the way he did? Now, I know sometimes we come in church. Now, let's just say, sometimes we come in church like we've been drinking lemon juice all week. But we come in church... And we're talking about the king of glory. We're talking about salvation of the cross. We're talking about the God who put the stars in the sky and put the planets into orbit and spoke creation into existence. We're talking about this. And then, oh, hallelujah, he's a great God. I think sometimes we just kind of need to let go and say, I know my God is a great, great God. He has done great things in the universe, and he has done great things in my life. I wouldn't be here today if he was not in me, and if he did not save me. Because I know myself, I would either be in jail or in the grave if Jesus didn't walk into my life when I was 21 years old and save me. I always have a reason to worship him. I always have a reason to thank him, even if I get outside of being a little bit dignified. I know some of us are just too sophisticated. Ain't that right, Rodney? We drink Fiji water, and I've missed my water over the last two weeks. I'm glad to have the Jackson 6 back with us today. Now, they had a COVID battle, so we're, we're glad to have them back. But does scripture condone this man's behavior? Shouting and falling on his face before Jesus. Well, in the Old Testament, there are 11 Hebrew words that are translated praise. Seven are used the most common, and I'm going to tell you those. You're like, why do you want to do this? Because it has a point, and I hope you can see that well. And I hope I don't brutalize the pronunciation. Todah, which means a, a thanksgiving choir. Barak means to kneel in thanksgiving. Tehillah means to sing a song of thanksgiving. Halal means to give thanks by being clamorously foolish. Dave, you ever been a little clamorously foolish? Yeah. Yada, and I don't mean just, you know, outside of church. Yeah. Yada means to give thanks with extended hands. Is raising our hands biblical? Absolutely. Zamar means to give thanks with a musical instrument. Shabbat means to give thanks with a loud tone, often translated shout in the Old Testament. Notice how each one of these words translated are connected to giving thanks. Seven of the 11 words used for praise in the Old Testament refer to giving thanks. But also notice it is biblical to shout. It is biblical to raise our hands. It is biblical to kneel. It is biblical to sing. It is biblical to use a musical instrument. It is biblical. Even at times it might seem a little foolish. Now I'll be honest. I'm not much of a shouter. I mean, okay, when I get, ever since I've come here, you people have done something weird to me when I arrived. I don't know if it's the horseshoe thing or what. 
but I got a little bit more emotional. That's never been me. But it's okay to raise your hands. It's okay if you want to say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's okay if you want to jump up and down. It's okay if you want to clap your hands. It's okay to praise and worship God physically, outwardly, emotionally. There is a verse in the Old Testament that actually uses four of these words in one verse. It's Psalms chapter 100, I mean, chapter 100, verse 4. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, using todah, thanksgiving choir, and his courts with praise, tehila, sing praises. Give thanks, yada, extended your hands to him, bless, barak, bow before his name. Now you can take this. And you can actually put those things in this, and that's not taking the scripture out of context, that's not changing the word of God, it is using the words as they are directly translated. So let's look at Psalm 104, paraphrase using those words. Enter into his gates with a thanksgiving choir, corporately together worshiping God, and into his courts with singing praises. Be thankful by the extending of your hands, and bless him by bowing before his name. It is appropriate to express God outwardly. Now, I'll say this. It doesn't mean we have to do it all the same way. I grew up in the Pentecostal church. It's, it's, it, you know, for a while, my brother was a Baptist preacher, and people always talk about me, me and him got our denominations mixed up because I wasn't very emotional. And my brother, you know, you met him. He is kind of emotional. And so, you know, it's a thing that I, I, I was always kind of almost condemned because I wasn't so outwardly emotional or I, I wasn't a shouter when I preached or those kind of things. We don't all have to be the same. God did not create a group of robots. It's not like when suddenly you become Pentecostal, you become emotionally weird, okay? <laughs> I remember the first time I, me and Carrie were on a date when we were at Lee, and we, were, we attended a revival at South Cleveland, and I was standing there, you know, hallelujah, you know, my little worship way. Because usually if I get really deep into worship, I get really quiet because I just kind of reflect on the goodness of God. And all of a sudden, Carrie starts shouting. I mean, shouting like an Indian going crazy. I mean, shouting. And I thought, well, this is the last time I'm going to go out with her. <laughs> and I think it was the last time I took her to a revival. <laughs> but it's okay. But we all, all have to be the same. You express God, but make sure that somehow, some way, you express God your worship to God. It may be the clapping of your hands. It may be raising them. It may be tears streaming down your face. It might be with a shout, but express that love to God. I don't want everyone to act the same way, but I do want everyone to show God how much we love Him, individually and corporately. We all have different gifts. We all have different personalities, and every person does not express their love in the same way, but every person has a way to express love, and we should do that to God. Many people don't know how to express their love to God in a biblical way because too many people grew up in dysfunctional families. And that's just a tragedy of, of, of living in a sinful world. They, maybe they lived in a family that didn't express their love to one another. And so expressing their love to another person, even expressing their love to God, is hard for them. It's something that they have to help, God has to help them with. Maybe in their family no one ever said thank you. No one ever showed appreciation for what was done. And so we, sometimes we have to realize that we come from a sinful family, a sinful culture, a sinful uh, personality, and that we have to allow God to bring us out of that. We can't just say, well, that's the, way I was, uh, that's the way I am and that's the way it is. No, we have to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit into who God wants us to be, not what our families maybe have led us to be. But many people grew up in a family that didn't express love, and that is a sad reality in this world. Many children never heard their parents say, I love you. Many children never grew up having a hug from their mother or their father. I've heard many people say that they never saw their parents show love for one another. That's not cultural, that's sinful. When a husband and a wife joined together by Almighty God does not somehow, some way express their love for one another, that's not a cultural concept, that's a sinful concept. Some people have never been hugged or shown affection. 
That's not, again, that's not cultural. That is a basic human need. They have proven that if a baby, when it's born, if it does not often receive touch, it will not develop mentally or even physically the way it is supposed to. That touch is very important in mental and physical development of a child. But many people grow up and not have that. And while you may have come from a family like that, you are not in a family like that anymore because you have been born into a new family and God is your father and God will express his love to you. God will show you his appreciation. There is no greater expression of love than that cross which is behind me. And as we've quoted this many times, he has proven and expressed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. You might have come from a very, very bad family, but now that you're in the body of Christ, you are in a good family with a good father. Now, sometimes your brothers and sisters might rub you the wrong way, but your father will never do that. Your father will not condemn you. Your father will not make you feel guilty or, or ashamed. Your father will love you. Now, he will, con he will convict you. He will correct you, but he does it because he loves you, because he wants to make you who he knows you need to be to be the best version of yourself. God's shown his love for us, and he wants us to express our love back to him. He wants us to express our love to one another, because again, it has to be expressed. Do not let your past experience prevent you from expressing your love to God, and don't let it keep you from expressing your love to one another. It's the truest form of love. It is pure Yes, we have different personalities, and some of them are more complicated than others. But if we will spend time loving God and worshiping God and expressing our love to God, He will pour His love into us, and it's going to pour out into our brothers and sisters in Christ. Gratitude produces worship, but what produces gratitude? Miracles produce gratitude. Miracles. Now, we use that word a little too light in the church, we throw it around. And often, I think in the Pentecostal church, we become miracle seekers more than we have God seekers. And I want to seek God. I want to know Jesus Christ. I want to know him better. And if miracles come around, let them come around. But I want to seek first the kingdom of God and then let him provide for me as he chooses and he wills. But in the church, we have often become miracle seekers instead of God seekers. Luke 17 and 15 then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back praising God with a loud voice. If you ever have received a miracle, you will be grateful. How many of you can say you've received a miracle? Whether it's healing, financial, I, I'll say this. If you're not raising your hand, you're not saved. Why? Salvation is the greatest miracle of all. You cannot even explain it. I remember being in China when we were trying to talk to our students, and I would talk about how I was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and in one day, just like that, I was set free. And they said, that's not possible. And I said, that's because God did it, not me. That is a miracle. When you come down to this, offering, this, this, this altar and you're in darkness and sin, bound by Satan, in a slave to sin, and just by the words, God, forgive me, please be my Savior, be my Lord, and the chains fall off of you, and you came down here as a child of the devil, and you leave a child of God, that is a miracle, and it should produce the greatest amount of gratitude that we have in our heart. I think sometimes we forget what it's like to be lost. I remember when I got saved, after I prayed, God, show me the cross. I prayed, don't let me forget what it's like to be lost. Don't let me forget that feeling, that emptiness, that despair, that I can't find peace no matter where I look. I cannot have real joy no matter where I go. Don't let me forget what that's like. But I think in the church, we often do forget we often forget that Jesus Christ is why we're here. It's not our own righteousness. It's not because suddenly we're now good people and we dress a little better and we talk a little better and we can kind of talk that biblical talk. It's because Jesus came in and he brought our spirit back to life and he allowed us to have a relationship to him. He connected us to the true vine and we have that life from him flows into us every day. And that is the only reason any one of us will ever see God face to face. It's because of the grace of God. But if you were a leper, 
And now I think a lot of us don't understand this story because we don't understand how horrible this disease was. What a great miracle this was. If you were a leper, you couldn't be around other people. I've heard people talk about during the, the lockdowns how difficult it was. And it was. I mean, when we were in the Middle East, they really locked us down. We couldn't leave our apartments at all. We couldn't have any kind of contact with anyone outside of our family. If we went to the supermarket, we had, to, we had an app that we had to apply for permission from the police to go to the supermarket for two hours. If you got caught outside and you couldn't show that permission slip, it was a $1,000 fine. Most people there were probably making about $250 a month. We were very obedient, and it had nothing to do with our respect for the law. <laughs> but it was, it was, we were really locked down. And this is a society that was so used to spending time together and fellowship and being around one another, having people in your home and being in their homes and, and spending a lot of time with people. And we were locked down. But in leprosy, you could not be around anyone ever. There was no end to it. It was a very contagious disease. It was a permanent lockdown for life. You had to keep your distance for everyone. And you could not touch another human being. Again, that is a human need. Not a personality need. That is a human need. You were a complete outcast. Anytime you got near someone, you'd have to shout, unclean, 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 so they wouldn't touch you or you wouldn't touch them. If you broke these rules, you, would be, you could be put to death. Just imagine that, to never touch another person, to never be around another person, to never have a meal with another person, that every time you get near another person, you have to shout that you are unclean. Think about that. If you had leprosy in Jesus' time and could never be around other people, you could never see your family. You could never touch your spouse. You could never hug your kids. And suddenly, a man came, Jesus comes by, and he heals you of that. Would you not want to express your gratitude and your love? But nine of them didn't. I've seen God do tremendous things in people's life, and within six weeks, they've forgotten all about it. I've seen God heal people of cancer. He's healed people of blindness. He's healed people who are lame. He's, healed, he's done incredible, incredible things. I mean, I've seen these things. I've seen cancers disappear. I've seen blinded eyes open. I remember one time we were in a church and, this, and they had never seen in their life, they were born blind and God healed them. God healed them. Not a man healed them. God healed them. And they just started screaming, I can see, I can see. And they were running around the church saying, what is this color and what is that color? Because they had never seen color in their entire life. They had joy unspeakable and full of glory. But God has done no less for you and I. No less. And we need to be a grateful people, an appreciative people. And if we are grateful, we will express that love because of the miracles God has done in our life and does in our life every day. We all have, we all have had the worst sin, man, I mean the worst disease man has ever been given. We had something far worse than leprosy. We've all been cursed by the disease of sin. It is the world's worst disease. Why? It keeps us from drawing near our Heavenly Father. It has put a distance between us and our God. It is so contagious that it has been passed down from generation to generation, starting with Adam and Eve. But Jesus, one day in each of our life, we all have a story, one day Jesus passed by. One day he wasn't too busy. One day he comes up to us wherever we are. And whether we were drowning ourselves in alcohol or running our lives with drugs or you know, caught up in all, all kinds of you know, sickness and sin and, and filth. And one day Jesus comes to us in that state and says, I have a better life for you. I'm going to make you clean. We have a reason to be grateful. We have a reason to be thankful and worship. We have a reason to express our love. And it doesn't matter who sees. It doesn't matter who hears. And it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. I've seen people worship. I watch people. You know, they weren't, are they raising their hands yet? Then I'll raise my hand. Are they clapping? Then I'll clap. Are they shouting? Well, I won't do that, but I'll just pretend like I'm not, I don't hear it. 
You know, one of the funny things about cameras in a church, <laughs> I remember in our church in the UAE, I used to get so tickled because the, the pastors all sat in the front in a church in the Middle East, and, you know, as the camera would go across the crowd, it was like the wave at the ball game. Everybody would put their hands up because suddenly they were on camera. They were going to get spiritual for that one moment. <laughs> but it should be in our heart all the time. Now, again, we don't, all, we don't all have to express our love the same way, but it has to be expressed. And it shouldn't matter what the person beside you is doing. I know what God has done in my life. If I want to raise my hands, I'll raise my hands. If I want to clap my hands, I'm going to clap my hands. No, I don't want to be disrespectful. I don't want to be chaotic. I don't want to do that. But when it comes to me expressing my worship to God, I know God is in heaven and he's taking joy in it if it's bubbling out of my heart. But if, he, if I'm doing it so I'm seen by other people, no, he doesn't take joy in that. And let's be honest, as Pentecostals, we've done it. I don't know if you, some of you have been in the church a long time. I don't know if you ever heard of the word courtesy dive. If you haven't, you can ask me later because I don't want to go into it. If you've been in the church of God very long, you've heard that term. <laughs> but it's appropriate to show our gratitude. It's appropriate to worship the one who saved us from our sin. But you say, Pastor, that was a long time ago. Jesus saved you 30 years ago. What if you were walking through Walmart and you saw Jesus? Would you just walk by some kind of casually and say, thank you for what you did for me, and keep going? Because some of you, I've seen you in Walmart, that's the way you shop. There has been people in this church who passed me in Walmart and didn't even realize I was there. I'm not going to tell you who you are, <laughs> unless I need some blackmail material later on. So, <laughs> no, I'm just I'm joking. But every Sunday, we gather here. Jesus tells us, when two or three are gathered in my name, I'm here. Every Sunday, you have an opportunity to think and worship Jesus for what he's done in your life. And often we fail to do that. We just pass him by. Is it still appropriate after 30 years to express our gratitude for salvation? Of course it is. I owe Jesus the last 30 years of my life, which I don't think I would have had if he hadn't have saved me. I owe him everything. Gratitude produces worship. Miracles produce gratitude. But what produces miracles? Now, I want to be careful in this one. Obedience produces miracles. Now, I want to say this. Now, it's not like I can do something and it makes God do something. I am not saying that at all. But very often, when it comes to a miracle in our life, God has told us to do something. He has told us to do this or to do that. And if you look in Scripture, many times before a person receives a miracle, Jesus told them to go do something first. And there's many things God has told us to do that we're not doing. And sometimes I think we're pushing God's hand away, his hand of grace. Every miracle is an act of grace. We do not earn miracles. We do not earn that. That is not what I'm saying here at all. But there's things that God asks us to do. For example, in Luke 17, 14. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they went, as they obeyed, they were made clean as they went as they obeyed they could have said I don't feel nothing I ain't going nowhere I don't like the priest anyway but they simply obeyed and because they simply obeyed then they were healed think about it throughout the Bible Noah's Ark Noah could have said well I ain't building no boat till it starts raining no, he starts building a boat. And you know they talked about him. You know his, I mean, my neighbor gets upset when I cut a little bit of their grass. I know Noah's neighbors were upset when he starts building this monstrosity of a boat in the front yard. But he didn't wait. He just starts building. God said, do it. He starts doing it. He did it in faith. Think about the walls of Jericho, marching around those walls. And I've shared this before. I was in the military. I can't imagine my leaders coming to me and saying, okay, before you attack this place, march around it singing like seven times and then start shouting and you'll get the victory. We'd have probably just shot them and said, okay, who's up next? But Jericho, obey. 
Do something that sounds absolutely, completely foolish, and I'll give you the victory. The Red Sea. <laughs> God tells Moses, point your stick at the water. Uh, like Moses is like, hey, you see that army that's coming back here? The most powerful army in the entire world. They're going to slaughter us like animals, and you want me to point my stick at the water? But he does it. Does it. What happens? The water splits. Going into the promised land at the Jordan. <laughs> Stick your foot into the water. Don't you remember the Red Sea? But they just obeyed and the water split. And there's so many, many ex examples of this. I read a story recently of a man. He was a homeless man, a jobless man. And he, he was praying, God, you've got to provide me a way. You've got to provide me a job. I, I, I want to work. I want to, I want to provide for my family, please. And God said, build a sawhorse. Yes, I had to look up what a sawhorse was, all right? I'm not a carpenter. But he tells him to build a sawhorse, and the guy builds it, and he's like, okay, what did that do? It didn't, that didn't provide me a job. That didn't do anything. And another guy passes by and says, hey, buddy, are you a carpenter? I got a job for you. It took obedience. Obedience produces miracles. Peter, walking on the water. Now, I know we like to criticize him because he eventually looked at the waves and fall in, but for a short period of time, he is the only human being that is not the incarnate God who has walked on the surface of water. But in order to walk on water, he had to get out of the boat when Jesus called him. Actually, that's a really good book if you ever want to read it by John Ortberg. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. It is important when you read Scripture to read it in context. Let's read it again. Luke 17, verse 1 to 10. Jesus said to his disciples, this is right before the story of him healing the lepers, occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better if you were, if, if, if you were a millstone were around, hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. You must forgive. The apostle said to the Lord, increase your, our faith. The Lord replied, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from the plowing, tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me? Put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink. Later you may eat and drink. Do you think the slave for doing what is commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to say, or ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Then he gives a story of the lepers. Increase our faith. Jesus tells him, basically what he's telling him, you don't need your faith increased. You just need to be obedient. You just need to do what I've told you to do. There are people among us, and, I, and, 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 and even in my own life, there's been times in which God has told me to do something, and I just didn't want to do it. I just didn't want to do what he told me to do. Why do I expect him suddenly then to do great things in my life when the one thing he's asked me to do, the obedient thing he's asked me to do, I did not do? And it's amazing. It is amazing when God asks you to do something and you take that first step, the miracles that begin to happen in your life, the doors that begin to open, the mountains that begin to move. I remember so clearly when God told me to come to Illinois, I said, you're nuts. You know, we'd, we'd felt God, you know, bringing us back to America. We saw what was happening in the church in America. We were moved in our heart. We're like, God, we feel like we have to do something. And then I get an invitation. Hey, would you like to come, Pastor in Kincaid, Illinois? And I'm like, okay, God, not there. California, South Florida, New York, that makes sense. And God said, no, there. I'm like, it's Illinois. They're Yankees. <laughs> Y'all don't think that's funny. In the South, that really works. 
And then I, you know, I, I said, okay, God, I don't understand why. I'll go. And as soon as I go, boom, 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 doors begin to open. <laughs> the church of God pays for the, par- the furniture and the partridge and my wife a car. And, and Brother Brian can tell you, church of God don't pay for nothing. <laughs> Miracles. I mean, honestly, just things that begin to happen when you take that step in what God has told you to do. We don't need our faith increased. We need to be obedient with the faith He has already given us. We don't need more faith. If we had just a little, it's enough to do what God has asked us to do. Jesus, our, He's our friend, but He's also our Lord and our Savior, has commanded us to do something, has asked and told us to do something. We need to do it. When the lepers come, he shows the disciples what happens when you obey. He tells them to go, show themselves to the priest, and as they are going, they are healed. They went, they obeyed, the miracle came. Many problems come in our life when we're not obedient to God. Many of our problems go away when we become obedient to God. This is true in our finances. It's true in our marriages, it's true in our family, and it is certainly true in God's church. Almost all of the problems in the church today are because of disobedience. Almost all of them. And many times we do not express our love to God because we're ungrateful for the things He's done. Sometimes maybe we don't show our love to God because we are angry at Him. Has anybody ever been angry at God? Not many hands go up. You're lying. Okay, it's okay. I'll give you a chance to repent in a few minutes. I have. Recently. When I had to leave China, to, when God asked me to leave China, I was so mad at God. I was so mad. I loved that place so much. God had given us so much love for the people. The ministry was going great. Twenty to 30,000 people were coming to Christ in China at that time every single day. It's the greatest revival had ever been seen. I'm right in the middle of it, and God says, go somewhere else. And I didn't want to go, and I was angry. Late last year, I was angry with God that he took me away from a people that I loved. It's okay to express our anger and our frustration with God. He's big enough that he can handle it. But I'm grateful for what he's done. But sometimes we get angry for what he's not done. And we can't do that. We have to realize who he is and that he always has our best in mind. If we would simply obey, it might not be the way we want, but we will see miracles in our life. There's been many, many times altar services like the one that's going to happen here pretty soon where pastors or evangelists or missionaries or whatever invite people to come. And you think, well, there's nothing special about this place. And you're right. It's not like God is here more than he is where you're sitting. It is simply an act of obedience. When, I, when, when an offering call is given... It is not that this brings something special or if I pray for you, a miracle is going to happen where someone else prays for you and won't. That's not what we're talking about. It's a simple step of obedience. We feel that in our heart. We know we have a need. Are we willing to take that step? And we forget about what he has done for us. Do you thank God for the food you eat? Now, I want you to think about it. Don't say it out loud. This is a rhetorical question. Do you thank God every time you eat? Or do you take it for granted that you have food? Or do you just assume, I paid for this food. I don't have to thank him for it. Now, I've shared this story about my Chinese grandmother before here, and I know some of you remember it because you don't like to talk to me before you want to eat. But I'm going to share it for those maybe who weren't here before. Carrie and I were in China for five years. Beautiful time in our life. It was our first missionary assignment. We, were, we went as English teachers, which was funny considering I'm from Alabama. But if you meet some of my students, they do have southern accents, all right? Uh, but we had this woman. She, we called her our Chinese grandmother. She wasn't our grandmother. She was an 80-year-old Chinese woman. She had suffered so much in her life. She lived in a room that was six feet by six feet. She's the poorest woman I've ever met in my life. 
She only made about $5 a month, which even in China at that time was not anything. Her family had completely forsaken her, had nothing to do with her because she became a Christian. Throughout her Christian life, she'd been able, at that time in China, it was very hard to get Bibles. And every time she would get a Bible, the police would come and take it away from her. One time they actually burned it in front of her. One time they actually urinated on it in front of her. They beat her so many times. She had scars all over her body where she was beaten because of her faith. But I have never met a more dedicated Christian in my life than this woman. When Carrie and I, the missionaries, you know, the superheroes of the Christian faith, when we would get discouraged, we would go to this little old Chinese woman to be encouraged. Because this woman knew how to talk about one thing, the goodness of Jesus Christ. Even though she had nothing, she talked about his goodness. And then one day she said, I want to cook you a meal. And we knew she was really poor, so we said, okay, we, let us pay for the food, okay? It's, 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 we know it's going to be expensive. And she said, no, no, no. She said, in the Bible, it says, if I give a prophet a cup of water, I'll get a prophet's reward. So what would I get if I cook missionaries something to eat? I'm like, okay, I can't argue with your theology. We'll come back next week. And so we came back next week, and she was sitting in her, you know, her little room getting everything ready. And I looked over, and I saw the plate of meat that, Carrie, that the, 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 our Chinese grandmother was going to cook for us. And I always tell people, you know, in America, most of the time, meat is red or brown. This meat was green. It was covered with mold, okay? And I looked at my wife. You know, missionaries are very spiritual people. We're much more spiritual than your average Christian. So I looked at Carrie. I looked at Carrie, and with great faith, I said, Carrie, we're going to die. Because <laughs> I knew we had to eat that because that's, you know, she, and I knew she probably got it out of the garbage can because there ain't no way she could buy any, any meat with what she made. And as she began to cut it, I didn't say this before, maggots kind of came out of it. And she began to pray. She prayed a prayer that I'll never forget. And I've never prayed over my food the same way. She prayed, God, I know this meat is bad. But it's all I have. And all I want to do is cook your servant something to eat. Please don't let them get sick. And please let it taste good. And Carrie and I have been all over the world. I've been in 62 countries, and to this day, I've never had a better meal than I had that day because she prayed over the food. Food is a miracle from God. Food, he provides it for us, that he gives us, and it should be thanked for. What is God asking you today to obey? What is he asking you to do? I guarantee you, every person in this room, God has told you to do something. It might be to come down to this altar and give your life to him. It might be to give something to someone, to encourage someone, to pray for someone, to go to this person and share your faith or that person, to speak to this family member or that family member. What is God asking you to do today? If we obey, miracles will follow. When miracle comes, gratitude will be present. And where gratitude exists, worship ignites. So what is God saying to you today? I'd like for you to stand up, bow your head, close your eyes. It is just 12 o'clock. Are we going to put God on a clock? Or are we going to allow him to change lives? Maybe your own. Maybe you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. You've never given your life to Him. Or maybe you did a long time ago, but you've not lived the life. You've not tried to follow Him. You've not been a disciple. And during this service, you felt something in your life. At, at a moment, either you felt something inside pulling at you, or something that I said, you felt like I was actually talking directly to you. That's not just a psychological phenomenon of hearing preaching. That is a way that God speaks to people. 
And if you felt that during this service, if you felt God pulling at your heart and you know you are not in Christ or you have strayed away from him, then I'm going to open these altars and I'm going to ask you to take that step of obedience, step out and come forward and give your life to Christ. You say, well, what do I do when I get up there? All you got to do is say, God, I'm sorry. 